Hello guys, my name is David Yoon, and I'm a transferring student here at UCLA. I'm also a member of the PSL. There are great talks and discussions happening right now. I just want to continue this momentum by talking about the effects of the US occupation in South Korea. First, if I ask people what their general opinion is about South Korea, I'll probably get something like K-pop, Korean barbecue, maybe plastic surgery, Gangnam style, something like that. And if I asked about South Korean relation to the United States, I would get you know, friendship, we're allies, we're strong, we stand together. And because of these opinions, South Korea is perceived to be a democratic beacon in East Asia and a sovereign nation. But the truth is that the South Korean people, even after the Japanese, have been fighting relentlessly against imperialism and yet another foreign occupation by the US. This is a very symbolic set of photos. So this is a city, um, in, this is in Seoul, and the biggest, up to this year, the biggest US base in Korea was in Yongsan. This is an area in Seoul. Yongsan was coincidentally also the head of the military operations of the Japanese colonization. And so you can see that when the Japanese flag went down, it wasn't the Korean flag that went back up in its own capital. It was the American flag that went up. Very symbolic of yet, another foreign occupation dominating the Korean people. So how did this all begin? Well, in September of 1945, the US forces led by General Hodge established a military o occupation that still lasts today. And this occupation, this illegal occupation at that, has stripped away the people of democracy, fundamental rights, and ultimately for the Korean people to shape their own nation. And I'm actually, I'm very glad that, uh, I'm sorry, so loud. I'm, I'm very glad that Professor Hong actually touched on the subject. Uh, she did a lot better than me. Um, you can see the, the, the people's community that she talked about was divided by provinces. It's like, you know, states. You can see it on here. This, this is how the province, and these are autonomous governments that were made by the people for the people, and it was not going to let yet another foreign power dominate Korea like Japan did. And of this, of course, did not work with General Hodge and the US plan for Korea. Oh. This is the uh, more pictures. She talked about the Jeju um, massacre. And the, thought, uh, the original number was actually estimated to be 30,000. But in recent years, the, number has, the research uh, has found that the total number was 80,000. This is a m crazy amount of people. And you can actually, these photos are all from the US National Archives. They stood by armed these soldiers, executed them, uh, executed the operation, and you can see US soldiers, are, officers are planning an attack on a certain village. And this is a, uh, a sad photo of uh, one of the happenings. And also officers, local officers that refused to follow orders to shoot villagers on site were executed. And again, you can see US involvement. There's, look like they're smoking a cigarette while officers are being shot right next to them. As you can see, the U.S. from the get-go never supported Korean democracy, right? She talked about, she showed a slide of Obama talking about how oh, we won, this is our legacy, we, we established, right, seven years of democracy. But from the get-go, as soon as the Korean people, within weeks, made a democratic system of government, General Hodge and his U.S. troops shot it down from the get-go. And we see this pattern of utter disrespect for South Korean democracy and really for Korean lives again and again as the U.S. props up arms and supports Korean dictators. And a very sad but great example of this was during 1980, um, in the city of Gwangju, a uh, massive protest, protesting the dictator of this guy named Chun Doo Hwan, who was also, like I said, raised, prop supported by the US. Students, workers, they all came out and they protested the dictatorship. You can't even see the bus drivers came out of their route and set up these, you know, these platforms for students to, uh, to come on. And it was, it was a very big movement for democracy, right? But what happened next was truly tragic. Not even the police, the military, special ops called Black Beret, came in the city and opened fire on civilians. So what was the US involvement with all this? First of all, and we'll talk about this a little later, but the Korean military cannot move without US command. And we'll talk about that a little later. And not only did President Carter know that this was going to happen, he provided them with air support and CIA intelligence for this to happen. And this is just one example of one dictatorship 
under the 70 years of U.S. occupation in the past. But the truth is, the U.S. occupation never supported democracy. The U.S. never supported peace in, in Korea. It only propped up hard, brutal dictatorship regimes that can maintain and make sure that the U.S. grip on Korea is maintained. And this is a very famous photo of a student who was my age from Yonsei University. And why I bring this up is because Yonsei University is actually sister schools with some of the UC schools. And you can actually see um, he's wearing the Yonsei shirt. This was taken seconds after he was shot in the head with a tear gas launcher. He died in the hospital shortly after this. And this caused, again, a lot of anger. It was a giant protest for him as well. And so what does the US occupation look like today in, the South, in, uh, in South Korea? There are two legal bindings that deem South Korea not as a sovereign nation, but almost as a colony to the United States. First, operational control. Two, SOFA. We'll talk about those two. We'll first start with operational control. So this is the official US military uh, definition. You guys can read over that while I'm speaking. Simply put, operational control is the operational commands of a military. Now, you would think that the South Korean president, having been, you know, Republic of Korea over 70 years, would have operational control over the South Korean military. It only seems so obvious that a president would have that. But the reality is, the Korean president never had operational control over the South Korean military. The U.S. did. This has been the case since the Korean War, when Korean troops were under the command of General MacArthur, and it is still a today, should war break out, Korean troops would again be in the hands of an American command. So when we talked about the Gwangju massacre, back, uh, where 2,000 protests were killed, not only with guns, but with aircraft gunships and tanks, it was, an, it, ex, it was a military operation that was executed on students and workers, and a U.S. operation, because it could not have happened unless the U.S. commanded it, because of OPCON. And this is a crystal sign of South Korea being not a, uh, not a sovereign state, and this really gets in the way of South Korea's sincere efforts to make peace. And because we saw a couple days ago an amazing moment where leaders of South and North Korea came together right, and vowed to make peace, a lasting peace in the Korean Peninsula. But the catch is, it cannot be done unless the U.S. consents. Why is this? Because not only does U.S. have OPCON of the Korean military, the U.S. signed the Korean armistice on behalf of South Korea with North Korea. It wasn't North, North signing with the South, it was the U.S. officer signing with the North officer. So it has to be the U.S. occupation that signs a peace treaty with the North in order to make true peace in the Korean Peninsula. And so how about the actual soldiers, the American soldiers in the Korean Peninsula? How is this detrimental to Korean society today? First of all, their very presence is illegal according to a document that you just saw Americans sign. This is actually illegal. You can see here, this is the Korean Army's Agreement. And speaking of illegal things, now let's talk about SOFA, or S-O-F-A. These are some of the conditions um, under uh, that place, South Korea under the agreement with the U.S. occupation. Okay, sorry. So, uh, crimes committed by U.S. soldiers are not handled by Korean authorities, but with American authorities. Land for U.S. bases is given for free. It actually has a California address. It's not a Korean address in Korea. And food, entertainment, any maintenance, anything you name it, is paid by t Korean taxpayers. For example, the, the biggest U.S. military base overseas is currently being built with 1,300 acres in Pyeongtaek in Korea, $11 billion, all paid for by Korean taxpayers. And so, if you're a Korean citizen, for example, because U.S. crimes are not handled by Korea, you can be walking with your friend to a birthday party, and a U.S. tank can roll over you, kill you instantly, and nothing will happen to those careless drivers. This sounds ridiculous, but this is actually exactly what happened in 2002 in the city of Yangju. So these two uh, middle school girls were in their town walking to a birthday party when a careless U.S. tank ran over them, killing them instantly. And this mobilized a protest of more than 50,000 people demanding two things, the withdrawal of U.S. troops and for justice to be handed out for not only the victims and the victims' families, but for really the entirety of the Korean people. Neither demands were met. As you can see, U.S. troops never left Korea. And second, these, the two careless drivers that 
drove over the two girls, walked away scot-free. And a US base in Seoul, in, in Yongsan, the one I mentioned, dumped 200 bottles of formaldehyde, which is a toxic chemical, directly into the Han River, which is a very, very, it's a very huge recreational, vacational spot, first of all, and it's, only, it's, it's also a major water source for the locals. And around US bases, the neighborhoods, thousands of rape cases committed by US soldiers are reported by Korean women, but most of them are swept under the rug. And because US soldiers are not checked by customs when they come into South Korea, they bring drugs with them, and a lot of them have been caught trafficking drugs as well in South Korea. And of course, toxic waste, murder, rape, drug trafficking, it's all illegal, right? Of course it's all illegal, but because of SOFA, it's not, it's not illegal. No one, gets, no one takes responsibility for these things. And before I close, I want to take this opportunity to talk about something that I would actually potentially be arrested for in South Korea under the national security law that he, he mentioned. Um, this, I, I cannot talk about this because it's very fresh. This happened in 2010. And so this is uh, the na South Korean naval ship called Cheonan. And this ship, in the middle of training, tore in half and killed 46 Korean sailors. Now, the official story is that North Korea fired a torpedo and a single torpedo somehow wrecked the ship in half and killed 46 people. That's the official story. And of course, I can't stand here and say I know all the facts and I know exactly what happened, but these are the facts. Studies have been done on the wreckage of Cheonan and studies researchers from universities from Cambridge and I believe Berkeley and from uh, universities within Korea have found that the damage is not from an explosive damage but a collision damage and the wounded and the bodies of the sailors did not sustain any explosive or burn injuries, but spinal injuries resembling like a car crash injury. And just so coincidentally, as you can see, so the left of the triangle and the right of the triangle is when the front half and the back half of the ship was found. In the same day, in the same time, a US nuclear class submarine was found with collision damage, sunk right in the middle. So what seems to have happened is a US nuclear submarine, but a nuclear submarine is run by a nuclear reactor, it's huge, it's massive. And the scientists have found that the hull of the submarine matches the size that would have caused this destruction, not an explosion. And so what seems to have happened is that the submarine rammed, accidentally rammed through the ship, tore it in half, and killing 46 people. Now, KBS, which is, a very, uh, which is the biggest news network in Korea, actually ran this story with this picture for an hour before it was taken by, down by authorities. And anyone who spoke about this threat, uh, or threatened with jail time or fines. And so the US occupation justifies its presence in South Korea by stuff like this, by saying, look, we're here to protect South Korea. We're here to enforce peace. We're here to maintain peace with our South Korean brothers and sisters. But it's not the North Koreans that are causing this. It's not the North Koreans going around raping, killing, trafficking drugs, dumping chemical chemicals in the, in the, it's not North Koreans doing that, it's the US occupation that has been doing what exactly they said they're protecting South Koreans from. So I wanna end with one last quote from General Hodge, who was the uh, first commander of the US forces in Korea. Okay. I'm enough of an imperialist to want to preserve the standards of living we've achieved in the US, and I firmly believe that we have benefited the nations into which we have extended our influence. All nations with a high standard of living has, have been imperialist. Our imperialism hasn't been in bad imperialism. <laughs> As you can see, US imperialism has not improved the lives of Koreans in any way. It has only brought war, it almost brought destruction, and not once has the US occupation kept the best interests of the Korean people at heart yet alone an ounce of respect for Korean dignity. American occupation, the American occupation has nothing but deadly and detrimental to Korean society and that does not belong in Korea. US troops are not welcome in Korea, it's never, it's never been welcomed in Korea, and will never belong in Korea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And given recent events where we saw a remarkable historic event of two Korean leaders coming together saying let's make an everlasting peace. Right? Then according to the US occupation's own reasoning, is the US occupation then necessary? 
because they say they're there to, they're to maintain peace. But we're seeing peace happening by Korean terms. So US occupation is really not needed in Korea. And so I want to end with last photo. Looks very nice. And we hope we see more of this. Thank you.